Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, fourth lecture of our 40 under 40 uh, lecture series on, on combustion. We have the pleasure to have with us uh, today uh, Professor Wenkai Liang. Um, it's a great honor to have him here to, to talk about uh, um, laminar frame studies for carbon neutral energy conversion. I will start with a small introdu introduction to this, our speaker, and then I, I leave the floor to him. So Professor Wenkai Liang is an assistant professor at the Center for Combustion Energy uh, at the Tsinghua University of China. He obtained his PhD from Princeton University um, in, in the US under the supervision of Professor Lo. Uh, his current research focuses on flame dynamics, combustion chemistry, and numerical methods for combustion simulations. He has published more than 40 uh, journal articles, and he has been awarded the Bernard Lewis Fellowship by the Combustion Institute, and also the George Markstein Best Paper Award by the US section of the Combustion Institute. So Professor Liang Wenkai, as I said, is a pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you here, and uh, please, uh, the floor, the virtual uh, floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the very nice uh, introduction. So uh, let me share my screen. Um, so uh, it's an honor for me to uh, present some of my recent work, uh, which is uh, mostly uh, about the uh, laminar flame um, for the uh, carbon neutral energy conversion. Uh, and also I would like to uh, thank the, uh, the Belgian section uh, of the Combustion Institute uh, for host of this uh, e-lecture series and also uh, inviting me to give the lecture. Um, so uh, my name is Wen Kai Liang and I'm uh, a faculty member of the uh, Center for Combustion Energy. Um, and I'm also affiliated with the Department of Energy uh, and Power Engineering at uh, Tsinghua University. Okay, um, so let's start with uh, uh, some background information. Um, so as we know, in order to um, achieve the uh, carbon neutrality, uh, we need to equalize the uh, uh, CO2 emission um, and then the CO2 reduced and offset, okay? Um, and to do that, uh, I think there are two major parts we need to worry about. Um, first is uh, how can we uh, use better these uh, uh, carbon neutral fuels? Um, and uh, the other thing actually is uh, uh, how we uh, use uh, electricity. And here, uh, actually, I want to focus on the uh, safety issue uh, associated with the uh, uh, lithium ion battery. Okay. Um, and then for the uh, field part, uh, I would like to introduce some of our uh, recent work for the uh, combined ammonia and hydrogen combustion. Um, and then for the uh, electricity part, I would like to uh, introduce some of our recent work regarding the uh, fire safety of the uh, lithium ion battery. Okay, so let's first uh, go to the part about uh, uh, ammonia and uh, uh, hydrogen combustion. All right, so um, as we know, the uh, ammonia is a, a carbon neutral fuel. It can be um, generated by the uh, renewable uh, electricity. Uh, also, the advantages of uh, ammonia include, for example, the uh, low production storage and the uh, transport cost. Okay. Um, however, we also have uh, several difficulties uh, for the uh, application of uh, uh, ammonia uh, in combustion. So all these, we can see all these uh, uh, difficulties actually are due to the low reactivity uh, of ammonia. Okay, and uh, uh, specifically uh, in this uh, in this part of my talk, I will talk about uh, um, how we can deal with uh, uh, the low laminar flame speed and also the uh, narrow flame bit limit associated with ammonia. Okay, um, so the basic idea uh, we want to uh, use is called the uh, stratification. Okay. Um, and then the, the idea of uh, stratification actually is uh, uh, not a new idea. People have used it before in uh, other background. Uh, however, here, what we want to do is actually, uh, we want to use uh, high reactivity fuel um, and also 
uh, we want to choose a high reactivity fuel, which is also carbon neutral. Uh, so therefore, we choose the hydrogen. Okay. Um, and actually, if you look at the uh, literature, there are already a lot of uh, previous works on the ammonia and hydrogen uh, binary field. Okay. Uh, however, one issue with uh, uh, previous studies that they, they all use uh, a homogeneous mixture uh, of ammonia and hydrogen. So therefore, they, uh, they, they do not uh, put in the uh, stratification in the problem. Um, and then if you look at the uh, previous works on the stratified flame, you will find that uh, uh, they all actually use the so-called uh, uh, equivalent ratio stratification. So which means that you, you use the uh, uh, different equivalent ratio at different positions. Okay. Uh, however, uh, for this strategy actually has some uh, issues for ammonia because we know uh, for ammonia, another uh, very important thing is uh, how to control the NOx emission. Okay, and also we know the NOx emission is very sensitive to the equivalent ratio. Okay, um, so so therefore we just uh, uh, think of a, a new way, which is that uh, we do not change the equivalent ratio uh, of the mixture, but rather we just uh, uh, impose some reactivity difference. Okay. Um, and here the idea is that we will just use the uh, reactivity difference between ammonia and hydrogen. Okay, um, so the setup actually is uh, uh, rather simple. Uh, you can see that uh, on the figure, um, initially we just have a hydrogen air uh, mixture. So initially the flame uh, will be a hydrogen flame. Uh, and then uh, it will go through a stratification layer, okay? Um, and then it will go into a low reactivity environment, mostly of uh, ammonia. Um, and uh, uh, one thing to notice is that in this configuration, uh, we do not have any uh, equivalent ratio stratification. Okay, so therefore it is uh, purely a reactivity stratification. Okay, uh, so then let's uh, uh, try to take a look at uh, if I initiate a flame from the high reactivity side uh, and then let it uh, propagate into the low reactivity ammonia side, uh, what will happen? Okay, uh, so first let me show you the, um, the flame uh, trajectory. Okay, um, so here you can see uh, in this figure, um, okay, so the number um, on the left actually is uh, uh, the percentage uh, of hydrogen at the uh, high reactivity side. So you can see it's always one. Uh, and then the other figure actually indicated the, uh, indicated the uh, hydrogen concentration for the low reactivity side. Okay. Um, and then if we look at the uh, trajectory of the flame, uh, we will see that uh, initially the flame propagate in the uh, hydrogen environment Okay, and then uh, it goes through the uh, stratification layer, uh, and then the flame will leave the um, high reactivity uh, mixture from this point. Okay, um, and the one interesting we found is that uh, actually when the flame uh, leave this uh, stratification layer and enter into the um, low, lower reactivity side, uh, which is uh, with more ammonia, uh, actually it, it's flame speed um, its flame speed does not drop down uh, immediately, but rather we can say, for example, um, for this range, uh, it can it will keep its uh, uh, flame speed, the high flame speed, uh, for quite a uh, long distance. Okay, um, and uh, uh, therefore, based on this uh, observation, uh, we can define this uh, uh, so-called uh, uh, sustaining lens. Uh, so basically, this capital L here uh, is defined as uh, uh, the distance uh, from the position where the flame leaves the stratification layer uh, to the position where the flame speed um, slows down to 90% of the uh, maximum flame speed. Okay, um, and the, first of all, we can make some uh, observations uh, for how this uh, sustained length change with the uh, hydrogen concentration. 
uh, on the lower reactivity side. And uh, uh, as we can see from this figure, uh, is there is a uh, clear trend that uh, when the hydrogen concentration increase, uh, the sustaining length has also increased. Okay. Um, so the reason behind this actually is uh, uh, rather simple. Uh, we can see that uh, if the hydrogen concentration on the uh, lower reactivity side increase, then we will have a lower um, lower reactivity difference between the two sides of the stratification layer. Okay. Um, and then we know that if there is a, a smaller difference, uh, then we know that the flame actually will uh, experience a, a, a smaller change in the environment. And therefore it can uh, sustain its original flame speed uh, for a longer distance. Okay. Um, so then the next uh, um, thing we want to discuss is uh, uh, we want to understand the why when the flame, uh, even when the flame leaves the uh, stratification layer and enter into the uh, lower reactivity side, why it can still keep the uh, high flame speed. So what's the reason behind this? Okay. Um, and uh, uh, one natural thing we, we can think about is uh, uh, in terms of the uh, temperature, the flame temperature. Okay, um, and as we know, uh, before the stratification layer, it is a hydrogen, and afterwards it is a, a ammonia. Okay, um, and then clearly we know that uh, for the flame temperature, uh, in terms of a hydrogen, uh, it is higher than the flame temperature in terms of uh, ammonia. Okay, um, and therefore we can see that in terms of the temperature, it will form sort of a a gradient um, in the temperature, okay? And therefore it will uh, support some heat into the flame. So this is called the uh, uh, thermal support uh, behind the flame, okay? Um, so then we want to uh, understand whether this is a reason why the uh, flame can sustain the high flame speed, okay? Um, and then uh, this is actually something uh, easy to examine. Uh, so what we can do is if we add in more nitrogen, uh, to the hydrogen side, actually we, we will bring down uh, the flame temperature for the hydrogen side, okay? And then what we do is that we add the amount of nitrogen such that the uh, flame temperature for the hydrogen side is almost equal uh, to the uh, flame temperature of the nitrogen side, okay? And then we call this situation uh, is uh, without the thermal support, okay? Um, and then we, we try to uh, compare these two situations. Uh, one is the black line is with this uh, thermal support, and then the, the red line is uh, without the thermal support. Um, and then interesting, we found that uh, uh, actually the difference between the two is not that large, okay? Uh, which tells us that uh, Maybe the thermal support is not the uh, most important thing uh, behind this uh, behavior. Okay, um, so then we try to uh, find uh, whether there are some uh, other reasons. Uh, so naturally, we, we think about uh, the chemistry, the chemistry of ammonia and hydrogen. Okay, uh, and then the first thing we did is we try to plot the um, ammonia concentrations at different time step. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, one interesting we found is that uh, actually uh, after the flame leaves the uh, stratification layer, uh, it's clear that this uh, um, profile of ammonia uh, will be uh, can be uh, observed in two stage. Okay, uh, so the first stage is actually a slow variation uh, of the ammonia, like this. Okay, uh, and then the second stage you can see is a very fast. Uh, consumption uh, of ammonia, okay. Uh, so the second stage we, we found it's more like uh, what happened in the uh, ammonia flame, basically the, the fuel can be uh, consumed very quickly, okay. Uh, and then we want to understand what is the first uh, consumption of ammonia, okay. And the one thing we, we suspect is that uh, at this uh, um, period, actually the, the ammonia has been uh, converted uh, into the, uh, the ammonia has been converted into the hydrogen. 
Okay, and then we, we have uh, observed the hydrogen concentration, uh, which you can see in the uh, figure on the right. Okay, and we found that uh, uh, indeed in front of the flame, we will have a very high uh, concentration uh, of hydrogen. Okay, uh, and then we want to understand whether this uh, hydrogen uh, uh, it was uh, something converted from the ammonia. Okay. Um, and then to um, understand this, actually there is a difficulty is that because uh, originally uh, in the mixture, we, we already put in uh, some hydrogen, okay? Uh, so then uh, the question is, uh, how can we, uh, how can we uh, separate whether this is a hydrogen from the original mixture or it is a hydrogen uh, generated from ammonia, okay? And then uh, to answer this question, actually we, we did a um, sort of the, the tagging um, in the kinetic model. Okay, so basically we, uh, we separate the hydrogen uh, into two different types. Uh, the first one we call it the generated hydrogen, uh, which means that this is not the uh, hydrogen in the original mixture, but uh, generated through some other reactions. Uh, and then the other part, we call it the original hydrogen, which is the, uh, just the original hydrogen in the mixture. Okay. Um, and then from the figure clear, you can see that if you add up these two, um, these two different uh, hydrogen, and then uh, it will give you the amount of the total hydrogen. Okay. Um, and then here we, we compare the generated hydrogen uh, with the original hydrogen. Uh, at uh, two different situations. Uh, so the figure on the left is before uh, it go into the uh, stratification layer. And then the figure on the right is after uh, it, go, uh, it goes through the stratification layer. Okay. Um, and then if we make a comparison uh, of the two, okay. Uh, and the, uh, one thing clear is that if, if we look at the uh, generated hydrogen, especially uh, here and here, okay, uh, after the, the flame actually uh, goes through the stratification layer, uh, the generated hydrogen is much higher, okay, uh, which means that uh, through this uh, stratification, indeed, uh, we can enhance the uh, hydrogen generation uh, from ammonia, okay. Um, and then the other thing uh, we want to test is uh, uh, through this method, can we really uh, enhance the generated hydrogen? Okay, so therefore we, we did a comparison. Uh, one is that uh, uh, we do a homogeneous mixture uh, of ammonia and hydrogen. And uh, the other is that we, we did uh, uh, this uh, stratified uh, ammonia and hydrogen. And then also we, uh, for the, um, for the fair comparison, we, we compare uh, both the generated hydrogen. So basically we, we do not uh, consider the original hydrogen in the mixture. We only consider um, the generated hydrogen uh, from the two different uh, strategies. Okay, um, and then through this comparison, you can see uh, obviously, if you use the stratified flame instead of the homogeneous flame, the generated hydrogen is much higher. Okay, so which indicates that uh, uh, by using this kind of uh, uh, stratification, indeed we can uh, largely enhance the um, ammonia conversion into hydrogen. Okay, um, and then the other thing uh, you may ask is uh, uh, what are the reactions that make making this ammonia into hydrogen? Okay, uh, and then to, to um, answer this question, we have also uh, did some kinetic analysis. Okay, uh, so basically we found what are the uh, important reactions that are converting uh, ammonia into hydrogen. Um, and then we, we found that uh, um, for the most important reactions, uh, these are included these five different reactions. For example, the uh, ammonia uh, plus the H atom into the, uh, into the NH2 and the hydrogen, okay. Uh, and then this uh, NH2 can again react with H alpha. Uh, so again, it will generate hydrogen. And then uh, NH again react with the H to generate hydrogen. Okay. Uh, so, so in addition to these three reactions, we found also 
um, there are other um, H uh, reaction with the H atom, for example, the HNO plus H, uh, which also uh, produce hydrogen. And the other one is the N2H2 plus H and the form the NH and the uh, hydrogen. Okay, so basically through all these uh, uh, reactions, we are able to actually uh, convert the, uh, the original ammonia uh, into hydrogen. Okay, uh, so, so after we, we sort of uh, understand what is the reason behind this behavior, uh, then we just uh, did some uh, parametric studies. Uh, for example, if you try uh, different uh, thickness uh, of the uh, stratification layer from 0.5 to 2, okay, and then the, the trend is like this, okay. Um, and then the other thing we, we study is the pressure. Uh, for example, if we increase the pressure uh, from one atmosphere to uh, five atmosphere, and uh, then with the same uh, stratification, actually we found that at higher pressure, actually the, uh, the sustaining length, uh, basically the red one is uh, shorter uh, compared with the situation of uh, one atmosphere. Uh, so this is also easy to understand because uh, uh, you know, at higher pressure, actually the uh, flame thickness is smaller. Okay, so therefore it's uh, more difficult to sustain um, for a longer distance. Okay, um, and then the other thing we want to uh, check is the, uh, because for the original setup, we, we just use a planar flame, which is uh, uh, without the stretch and the curvature. Uh, so then we have uh, used another uh, configuration, which is a spherical flame, uh, shown as uh, red lines. Uh, and then you can see if we change the configuration uh, from the planar case to the spherical case, okay, uh, actually the sustaining length is much shorter. Okay. Uh, so the reason actually is uh, also uh, easy to understand because if you have a, a spherical flame, then as the time evolves, um, the, the, uh, the total surface area of the flame uh, will increase. Right? So, uh, so therefore the uh, regenerated hydrogen will be sort of diluted by this uh, increasing surface area. Okay, um, and uh, finally, the other issue we, we want to uh, ask is uh, um, the, uh, for all the previous uh, um, results I show you, these are all at the uh, stoichiometric condition, which uh, means uh, the equivalent ratio is equal to one, okay? Uh, however, one, one issue with ammonia is that uh, ammonia has a very narrow uh, flammability limit. Okay, uh, so then we, we want to check whether by using this uh, strategy, can we uh, burn the ammonia beyond its flammability limit? Okay, uh, so therefore we have chosen uh, two uh, cases. One is a lean case, the other one is a rich case. Okay, um, so as we know for the flammability limit, um, hydrogen flammability limit uh, is wider than the uh, ammonia flammability limit. Okay, um, so therefore what we do is that uh, uh, for the lean side and also the rich side, we choose a equivalent ratio, uh, for example, here and here for the uh, lean and the rich, uh, such that it is within the flammability limit of hydrogen. Uh, however, it is uh, outside the flammability limit of ammonia. Okay, uh, so then we, we say uh, for this kind of the situation, can we burn ammonia? And uh, then the result we, we found is that uh, uh, indeed uh, it can burn the ammonia. Uh, however, the, the, uh, this uh, effect also has sort of the memory, um, memory effect, which means that it can only sustain uh, for a short period or short distance, okay, uh, and then afterwards it will deviate. Okay, um, so basically this is the uh, uh, first part that I want to uh, introduce uh, to you uh, one of our recent work uh, about uh, uh, ammonia and hydrogen flame. Um, so I, I want to read all the uh, conclusions. Uh, so basically we found that the flame can uh, sustain its uh, uh, high flame speed 
Okay, and then we did uh, some uh, parametric studies and also uh, try to understand uh, whether it can promote it beyond the frame validity limit. Okay, um, and then for the second part, uh, I would like to talk something about the uh, lithium ion battery fire safety issue. Okay, um, so as we know, the, the lithium ion batteries uh, has been, uh, have been widely used in uh, sort of all the uh, electric devices, for example, uh, your cell phone, your laptop, uh, and also it's widely used for the uh, electric vehicles. Okay. Um, however, one uh, issue of the uh, LIB is that uh, it, it has a, a relatively poor thermal stability, which means that uh, it can uh, catch fire or explode quite easily. Okay, so uh, here I just want to show you uh, two videos of the uh, real world situation. Okay, uh, so you can see the one on the left actually is an electric car uh, that the, the battery. Um, the battery uh, caught fire and then uh, it will just burn. Okay, uh, so I think this is when the car is uh, um, being charged. Okay, and uh, uh, then the second video is the uh, electric bike uh, in the elevator. Okay, so, so from these uh, videos, we can see that uh, the, the, the LIP fire can be very dangerous, right? So then we want to uh, understand what is, uh, uh, what is the reason of this uh, fire safety issue. Uh, and also we want to uh, ask how can we evaluate the safety uh, of the, what we call the, uh, the battery vent gas, which is a gas uh, released from the battery fire, okay. Um, and then to, to answer this question, uh, first, uh, uh, we need to understand something about uh, uh, why there is a, a LRB fire. Um, and uh, actually, uh, in this very good uh, review paper, um, people have shown that uh, there might be the uh, mechanical abuse, uh, for example, the crash or penetration, uh, electric abuse, for example, the uh, short circuit uh, overcharging, and so on. Um, and then also the uh, thermal abuse, for example, the overheating. Okay, um, and also this really normally happen uh, in a sequence, uh, which means it, it starts with the mechanical and then goes to the electric and then uh, finally goes to the thermal. Okay, um, and the, eventually they will all uh, go to this uh, uh, thermal runaway behavior. Okay, um, and then for the thermal runaway behavior, uh, normally we're concerned about uh, two issues. One is uh, explosion, uh, and then the other is uh, flame behavior. Okay, um, so then we want to study like uh, uh, what can we, uh, what can we uh, do to evaluate, uh, the, for example, the explosion and the flame of the LIB fire. Okay, um, and uh, therefore we have uh, uh, sort of chosen two limits. Uh, one is the uh, flame base limit, which is to quantify the uh, flame behavior of the LIB fire. And uh, the other is the explosion limit, uh, which we use to quantify the explosion issue of the LIB fire. Okay, uh, so then let's first look at the flame base limit. Okay, uh, and then to um, understand that, first of all, we, we build a model for the uh, battery vent gas uh, with a different uh, state of charge. Okay, uh, state of charge, you can simply understand as uh, uh, how, how much you charge the battery. Okay, um, and then we can see that the, the components include, for example, CO, CO2, hydrogen, methane, and so on. Okay, and then after we build this uh, uh, field model for the uh, BVG, um, and then we can use that to simulate a flame. Um, and then in this uh, simulation uh, from our previous study, we have uh, also sort of put in the radiation model uh, into, the, uh, into the flame simulation. Uh, and uh, uh, also you can see that basically here shows you the, um, the temperature profiles and also the uh, radiative heat loss uh, for different uh, uh, models. 
Uh, and then the one we, we adopted in this study is this uh, SMB CK model. Uh, and then within the SMB CK, you can actually do different uh, uh, bands uh, for the different uh, uh, cost of computation. Okay. Um, and then by uh, using these two models, actually, we are able to uh, resolve the, the flame structure near the uh, flame bit limit for the BVG. Okay. Uh, and also, uh, in order to uh, understand how we can suppress this uh, BVG fire, we have also added some um, inert species, for example, the uh, carbon dioxide, water, and nitrogen, uh, to see how they can uh, inhibit this flame. Okay. Um, and then, through this calculation, actually, we are able to quantify the flame bit limit uh, of the BVG fire. Okay. Uh, so the figure on the left is the um, flame base limit. Okay, uh, so the lower part uh, is the lean limit, and then the upper part is the rich limit. Okay, um, and then the excess actually, so if we put in different amount of the uh, inert species, and uh, uh, we have also did the experiment. Uh, so first you can see that uh, the, the comparison between the uh, simulation and the experiment is uh, pretty good. So they agree uh, for, for most of the situations. Um, and the, the other observation we found is that if you uh, add in uh, enough amount of the inert gas, uh, actually the lean limit and the rich limit, they will converge uh, to a single point, which we call the uh, absolute limit. Okay. Uh, and, and then you can see that uh, uh, beyond this absolute limit, actually the, the entire different ratio space is uh, non-flammable, okay? So which means uh, uh, it is always safe, right? Um, and then you can also sort of uh, quantify that uh, in the safety triangle, okay? Um, so basically the, the three axes are the uh, air, inert gas, and the BVG. And then we found that the, the flammable range actually is just this uh, uh, small triangle. And then if you use different inner gas, this triangle will be different, okay? Um, and then we found that if you use water or uh, CO2, actually it's roughly the same. Uh, and then for nitrogen, the flame, uh, the flammable range is a little bit higher. Okay, um, and then um, the next thing we have did basically is we compare some uh, flame properties uh, near the flame bit limit. For example, the uh, flame temperature, uh, the flame speed, and also the uh, flame thickness. So basically by using this model, you can quantify all these uh, flame properties near the flame bit limit. Um, and uh, then the other thing we, we consider is, uh, uh, can we build a simplified model, okay? And then we just use uh, this uh, uh, kinetic criteria from Professor Law's book. Um, so the idea is that if we do a relative uh, sensitivity of the uh, chain branching reaction uh, with the uh, chain termination reaction, and then this uh, sensitivity actually will uh, approach one here um, near the flame bit limit. Okay, and then we just use this to evaluate the flame bit limit uh, for the BVG. Um, and then from this theory, uh, what we observed um, is like this. Okay, um, and then you may ask me, uh, is this, uh, um, so then you may ask me, uh, is this the flame bit limit obtained from the kinetic criterion uh, the same as your uh, simulation result, right? And then we just did a comparison, okay? Uh, so the black symbols are the uh, results obtained from this uh, kinetic criteria. Um, and then uh, we have uh, uh, plotted it versus uh, the uh, simulation result. You can see that it, it always uh, uh, agree well with the simulated result, okay? Uh, however, from the previous studies, people normally use the so-called uh, Le Chatelet's principle to evaluate uh, the flammability limit. Okay, so we also show the result from the LC principle. Uh, and then you can see that uh, 
from the LC principle, actually the, the predicted frame rate limit uh, is largely deviated from the uh, simulation result. Okay, uh, so which shows that actually uh, by using our kinetic criteria, you can get a much better prediction for the uh, BBG frame rate limit. Okay, um, and then for the second part, uh, I would like to uh, briefly talk about the uh, explosion limit uh, of the BVG. Okay, uh, so this is uh, uh, actually um, the other side of the fire safety issue of uh, LIB. For the flame rate limit, we are mostly concerned about the flame propagation. Uh, but for the explosion, we are more concerned about the sort of the uh, auto ignition issue. Okay. Uh, so then for different conditions, we can uh, quantify whether it is uh, uh, explosive or not. Um, and then for the boundary, we can uh, get, uh, get it uh, as a line in the temperature uh, and the pressure um, diagram. Okay. Um, and then we can see that uh, um, for this boundary on the uh, lower temperature and the lower pressure side, this is uh, uh, non-explosive. Okay, um, and then on this uh, um, on this uh, high temperature and high pressure side, it is uh, uh, explosive. Okay, and then the, the boundary is what we call the uh, explosion limit. Okay, uh, so the first thing we, we observe is uh, how this boundary change as we change the state of charge. Okay, um, so from our uh, intuition, we, we will think that, uh, I think most of us will think uh, if the battery is charged more, right, so which means with a higher SOC, it is easier to, to explode. Okay, uh, so this is actually true uh, if we look at, uh, for example, uh, some pressure ranges. Uh, however, the, uh, one thing interesting we found is that uh, uh, sometimes it is not always true. Sometimes you will have a non-monotonic change in the um, in the explosion limit, uh, which means that, uh, uh, for example, at this pressure, uh, actually the most explosive condition uh, is 25% uh, uh, SOC. Okay, and then if you go to different pressure, this most uh, uh, explosive SOC will also be different. Okay. Uh, so basically, it means that uh, the detailed kinetic will uh, play an uh, important role in this problem. Okay, um, and th then we, we also have uh, examined the, the effect of the uh, equivalent ratio. Uh, so as the equivalent ratio uh, increase, you can see that actually there is uh, what we call a crossover point. And when the pressure is higher, uh, it will move uh, to the uh, to the left side. However, when the pressure is lower, it will move to the right side. Okay. Um, so then the, the next thing we did is um, because we know the, the BVG actually is a fuel mixture. Uh, so then we want to understand whether we can compare the BVG with uh, some uh, single component fuel uh, explosion limit. Okay. So therefore, we have, we have chosen two different uh, conditions. One is the uh, uh, zero percent SOC, and the other actually is the overcharged uh, SOC. Uh, and then we compare these two with uh, some uh, single component fuel, uh, for example, hydrogen, uh, carbon monoxide, methane. Okay, um, and then we found that actually uh, for this uh, uh, overcharged, uh, basically the pink line here, uh, it is uh, close to the uh, hydrogen situation. Okay. Um, and then uh, when the SOC is 0%, actually it's closer to massing. Okay. Um, and then uh, the other thing we found actually is uh, also interesting is that uh, we know in the SOC, we have a very small amount um, of, the, uh, of the C2 species. Okay. Uh, for example, this uh, uh, acetylene. Uh, and then we want to see whether this uh, small amount of C2 species uh, will play some role uh, in the explosion. Okay, so then, uh, for example, here I just show you uh, a simple sensitivity result. Uh, you can see that uh, indeed the C2 species will show up uh, in the result. For example, this uh, 
uh, C2H5O2 reaction and also this uh, C2H4 reaction. Um, and uh, uh, then on the other side, you can also see the uh, C2H4 reaction, C2H5O2 reactions to be important uh, in this problem. Okay. Um, and also you can, for example, if, if we delete uh, some of the uh, C2 species reactions, and then you can see that indeed the boundary uh, will be uh, different, uh, especially at the higher pressure side. Okay. Uh, and then finally, we have sort of uh, checked some of the kinetic pathway uh, of this uh, uh, C2 species. Okay. Um, and then here we have chosen the uh, ethylene as, uh, as, as uh, uh, the typical C2 species. Okay. Um, and then we have found that uh, uh, actually uh, the, the kinetic pathway uh, will be quite different if we consider, uh, for example, the, the low pressure situation. Uh, here are the, uh, for example, these uh, uh, blue lines uh, is at one atmosphere, and then the, um, the, the red symbols are at two atmosphere. Okay. And, and then we found that the lower pressure actually mainly um, will go through the, uh, the left X-ray pathways. So basically these three. Okay. Uh, and then to, it will form uh, some other radicals, uh, for example, the C2H5 here. Uh, however, if we go to the uh, higher pressure situation, for example, two, 200 atmosphere, okay. And then the C2 species uh, actually will go through a different pathway, okay. Um, and there's this uh, three on the right, uh, for example, the plus OH reaction plus, and also the two different uh, uh, pathways uh, of the uh, plus HO2 reactions. Okay, uh, so, so basically it tells us that uh, although the uh, C2 species will always play a important role, however, the, the kinetic pathway it goes through are uh, sort of different if we look at the lower pressure uh, compared with the higher pressure situations. Okay, um, so basically this is a part on the uh, LIB fire and we have uh, uh, mainly studied two limits. Uh, one is the flammability limit, and uh, the other is the uh, uh, explosion limit. Okay. Um, and then for the uh, flammability limit, uh, we found it's uh, essentially affected by the flame radiation interaction. Um, and also we can build up a kinetic criteria to quickly uh, evaluate the flammability limit uh, of the uh, LIB fire. Um, and also we have uh, uh, observed the, uh, something about the explosion limit. For example, the non-monoponic dependence on the uh, SOC. Okay. Um, and the kinetic, we also found that the, the small amount of the C2 species uh, in the BVG actually plays an uh, important role uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the process of uh, explosion. Okay. Um, so with this, I would like to uh, conclude my talk. And uh, I would like to thank you for your uh, kind attention. And uh, uh, I'm glad to take uh, uh, any questions from the audience. Um, and uh, uh, if you, by the way, if you have any other questions, you can also uh, contact me through my uh, email here. Um, and uh, uh, in addition, I, I want to say that uh, um, at uh, my place, actually, currently, we have a lot of the PhD student opening and also the postdoc opening. Uh, so if you are interested, you can also uh, send me an email. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, this uh, interesting talk. Yeah, very nice. I, yeah, well, we can start the Q&A session. Um, right. are, there, are there any questions from, from, from the audience? Okay, I see, I see one question from the audience. I'm going to... Um, yeah, Marco, please, if you want to ask a question. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for uh, this nice presentation. I was interested in the um, in the thermal runaway in uh, batteries. Right. So I was wondering. Um, 
how did you define or where did you take this information about the composition of the vent gas? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a, a very good question. Um, and actually, these are from some of the uh, previous experiments. Uh, so basically, what they do is that they, they um, intentionally um, let the fire to, to go through the thermal runaway. Um, and then through the process, basically, they can control, for example, the uh, SOC of the battery. And also, uh, we can control, for example, the, uh, the materials we use in the battery. And then we try to uh, measure what are the components uh, in the battery. Uh, but actually, there's uh, one issue is that the, the, the BVG can have many different components. Uh, so here we have sort of chosen uh, a simplified model, which, which is that we only consider the uh, component, for example, with more than uh, 5 or 2% uh, uh, in the total component. And then we, we can sort of build, a, build up a model for the BVG component. Okay, thank you. Because I, I can understand the hydrocarbons from the carbonates, but uh, I would expect also some inorganic species. And in right, that right, that's true. So, so here we, we, we actually did a simplified version of the BVG. So we, we actually neglected some of the uh, components yeah, but actually in, in our future works, uh, uh, we want to build up a sort of a more complete model uh, for the BVG to include uh, like uh, more uh, components. Okay, I see. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Are there any other questions from, from the audience? Um, okay, I see no no raised hand. Um, so yeah, um, I have a question related to this. Uh, yeah, I guess a bit related to the question that uh, Marco yeah. asked regarding yeah. um, regarding the experiments that you perform for the flammability limit of uh, the BVG. Can you give us uh, more more details? How did you? Yeah. So um, actually, uh, here I. I think I show some of the uh, experimental result. Um, yeah, I, I guess on the slide uh, 28, yeah. Right, right. Uh, yeah, here. OK, um, so, so as you can see that uh, here, actually, we have both the uh, simulation result uh, and also the uh, experimental result. Uh, so the experimental result, basically, uh, what we do is uh, uh, we use, uh, uh, for example, the, the spark or something to force the ignition. Of the flame, okay, um, and then uh, in the environment we can uh, actually you can visually see the flame, and then we just see whether this flame is able to propagate uh, in in the uh, experimental apparatus we are using, okay, and then uh, we can for example try different uh, uh, compositions of the gas. So basically, you can try uh, like uh, several different points, uh, for example, uh, along this line. Okay, um, and then you will find that uh, for some of them, clearly you will see the propagation uh, of the flame, for example, here. Uh, however, for some others, the flame will extinguish very quickly. Okay, so then the boundary will just give you the uh, experimental determination for the flame, basically. And what kind right. of experiment? Uh, so, Is that a shock tube? No, what kind of experiment? No, no, it's a... Uh, uh, Sort of, it's also like a flame, but it, mm -hmm. it, it's sort of like a flame in a tube. But it, you need to use a spark to first uh, give some sauce to initiate the flame. And then when the flame uh, is uh, like uh, propagate to, to the uh, downstream, and then you can uh, observe whether it can be sustained by itself or not. Okay. Yeah, so, so hope that uh, answers the question. Yeah, yes, it's, you did. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe, Salvador, I would ask uh, a question if I can. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. Concerning the first, uh, thank you very much, Ken, for this very nice talk. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I was wondering if you 
uh, can say something in the first part concerning the emissions of uh, right, right. ammonia hydrogen and the trade off the trade off between ammonia slip and the uh, NOx emissions. Right, very good question. Um, so actually, that's something uh, we are also uh, concerned about. Okay, um, and uh, uh, as we know, for ammonia, uh, the, the most uh, concerned thing is right? NOx, um, And uh, actually, for the uh, ammonia burning, uh, the NOx is very sensitive to the equivalent ratio, right? So we know uh, for the uh, lean side of ammonia, actually, we have a lot of NOx formation. And then for the rich side, we will have some of the unburned uh, ammonia, right? Um, and then here, the, the advantage in our strategy is that we can actually fix the equivalent ratio of the whole situation, okay? Uh, so therefore, we can always burn it uh, at the uh, best position where you have the minimum amount of emission. Um, and then the, the other thing uh, we have concern about actually is uh, um, the, the original hydrogen flame, okay? So as we know, for the hydrogen flame, the issue is the uh, flame temperature actually is higher, okay? So therefore, you will have more thermal NOx. And then uh, when the flame goes into the ammonia, actually for a certain time, it will actually keep the high temperature. And then this high temperature actually will give you more thermal NOx. Okay. So one thing we are thinking now is actually, uh, actually it's like what we did here. Um, we can actually make the hydrogen side more diluted. Therefore with the lower temperature and then you can also uh, reduce the, uh, the thermal NOx for these kind of situations. Yeah, but, but that's actually a, a very good question and also a very important thing we are uh, concerned Okay, so about. you're to looking into fuel dilution. Right, right. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Salvo. Yeah, no problem. I guess, uh, yeah, when um, by lowering the temperature, you could get also some uh, more insight into the SNCR mechanism yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Um, I, I have a question actually. Uh, okay. Yes. I'm Lorenzo, <laughs> I'm Giuntini. And uh, uh, thank you for the very nice talk. And uh, I have a question because uh, uh, you've talked about that uh, at link condition, we can have, uh, okay, lots of uh, NO emission when we burn ammonia, but while uh, in uh, rich condition, we have ammonia slip. So uh, do you think that uh, uh, there is a, like a, a multi-stage multi -stage combustion of ammonia can be like uh, uh, interesting and uh, can have future for the ammonia combustion yeah, or is yeah. something? Uh... Yeah, of course. Yeah, so that's also a a very good point uh, because, uh, as you know, actually in some of the uh, industries, people use ammonia uh, to reduce the NOx. Right? So that actually is, uh, I think, through the uh, some of them are through the stage combustion uh, process. Okay, uh, but the, the key issue here, I, I think, is actually how you can uh, control the uh, sort of the amount of ammonia and also the equivalent ratio at the different stages. So this is also uh, something we are looking into. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so hopefully in the near future, we will uh, show more results, like uh, for example, using uh, staged combustion and uh, whether we can further reduce the, uh, the NOx emission in this situation. So yeah, so, so my point is that it's all about how you can control the process. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I guess it opens up a lot of opportunities for investigation, the effect of fuel dilution, diluents like oxy fuel or some sort of yeah, exhaust gas recirculation, all these kinds of things. That's uh, interesting uh, yeah. research. Okay, yeah, the, and we are pleased to uh, have gotten the opportunity to, to listen to your research and get to know more about, about it. Okay, I guess, yeah, we can, if there are no more questions from the audience, we can uh, close the the session. And we thank again the, the speaker for- Thank his, you very uh, much. Thank you very much. Interesting talk. 
And uh, yeah, the next lecture will be in uh, one week time. So I'll see you hopefully everyone there at the okay. next uh, next next week. Thank yeah, uh, okay. thank thank you again, Professor Liang. And yeah, thank bye. You have a nice weekend. Inviting me. Yeah, I, I guess I should say uh, have a good day for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay. Nice evening to you and uh, a nice weekend too. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thanks.